So anyway, Dave and I are really excited to be here. You want to say anything before we get going? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about movie making. I, I have it in the presentation, but Rick and I have done over 150 videos together, uh, 16 DVDs, six of which for Wiley Publishing and Canon Cameras, about Canon Cameras. So we've known each other a long time. We live in the same town. We eat uh, many times together, so. Uh, <laughs> eat sushi, right? <laughs> yes, that's right, absolutely. So, so here's the question. How many people here have iPhones? Okay, iPads. Oh, not too many people have iPads. Okay, well, at the end of our talk, we, as it said on the uh, website, we're giving away coupons for free iPhone uh, apps. Right, or I, iPhone, uh, Light at Light. Light at Light. And we uh, have it for the we're giving iPad. 10 for that, and we're giving 10 away for the iPad version of it. So if you don't have it, uh, you're gonna, you could win it. And if you have it, you can give it to someone else. Okay? All right. So why don't we get going again? I'm going to be talking about lighting for about an hour. If you have any questions, this is a relatively small group. Ask questions during the presentation. If it requires a very short answer, I'll answer it, or David will answer it, you know, as we're going along. If it's a longer answer, then we'll answer it uh, during the break. We'll take a break after I speak. So it's about 3 o'clock. I'll stop at around 4 o'clock, okay? How many people here know nothing about lighting? Good, good. How many people here own a lighting kit? Okay. Oh, good. Very good. How many people here own a flash? Just about everybody. Okay, cool. So oh, well, I got the movie oh, first. Oh, yeah, that's right. Set Before up, we get going, show, show right, very good. Yeah. I forgot. Before we get going, uh, David shot a movie. This is actually a very interesting story. We have we want to do an introduction, an introductory movie for the app for the iPhone. But we also wanted to use a movie that we could use for marketing purposes uh, and spread the word that we had an app out to promote this app. Right. So we hire a, a designer. We hire a model. We drive around the city for three hours looking for a location, and after about three hours, we finally Perfect location. On, found a great location. So this video, well, you can talk a little bit about the video. Right, so the video we <laughs> shot uh, took us, once we found the location, it took us like a half hour to shoot the video, right? And then it took another two hours to edit it. Um, it's in the application itself, which we'll show you later, but it's a combination of what the application does, but also it's a free lesson from Rick about lighting on the street. It's a, I think it's a really great lesson. Okay, so does anyone have any questions on, on the making of that movie, on the lighting technique, on anything that uh, we talked about so far? No? Good. If you are shy, and a lot of people are shy in these, uh, in these presentations, as, as I have found. If you just go to my blog and click on Meet Rick, all my contact information is there. Just go to ricksalmon.info, www.ricksalmon.info, and... I'm happy to answer any questions. Is there anyone here in this room who ever sent me an email that I didn't answer? I can ask that question with confidence because I always answer every email. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, yes. No, you never answer uh, my email. That's true. <laughs> uh, okay, he's a friend, though. <laughs> what did you use to shoot the video? David? Oh. Um, you should come in the light so we are recorded for the great camera system here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually used two things. I used a Sony HDV camera to do this stuff on the street, and all the inserts were shot with a uh, T2i uh, because we had the camera in house because we had just finished a DVD about how to use the T2i. So I used the high def video for that, and it was cut in Final Cut Pro, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Shooting is is an art. Editing is even another completely different art. You know, when I'm done, when, when we're done, I'm done. <laughs> and David has to go back and put all these things together. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing process watching David work on the final, with final, you use Final Cut Pro, final right? Final Cut Pro. Okay, cool. So if you, have a, if you have any questions, just go to Meet Rick. I'll be happy to answer all your uh, questions. But ask questions again during the presentation because it makes the presentation more fun for David, more fun for myself, and more fun for the other people here. It kind of makes it uh, interactive. Also, you can follow my blog, Rick Salmon's Digital Diaries. I have new, new stuff up there almost uh, every day. So let's talk about this shoot. Again, this part of the presentation is about lighting. But if you have a photography question, if you have an ISO question, you know, white balance, anything like that, a philosophical question, ask that because the whole thing about a picture actually the most important thing about a picture is the feeling of a picture right so if you have a question about a feeling of one of the pictures that I've, ta that I've taken please ask so anyway 
It's very important in photography to envision the end result. Ansel Adams was really big on envisioning the end result. He talked about this a lot. So as photographers, it's important for us to envision the end result. And I talk about that in my books. And by the way, I have a few of my books over here which I could uh, autograph for you afterwards. And if they're signed, they're worth more after I'm dead, right? So <laughs> it's not, not like a bad deal. Anyway, I'm envisioning the end result two ways. I'm thinking about what's going to happen in camera and what can I do in Photoshop or Lightroom or Aperture. Because we can do so much. We could, as simple as, you know, toning down the highlights, opening up the shadows. It's really important to envision that end result. So when we were driving around, we found this background and we envisioned this really super busy background, but we also wanted the model to stand out. So we actually had a stylist with us who did all the styling here down to, you know, the costume jewelry on the black gloves, which really adds to the shot. That, the stylist really, really helped us with this. One quick uh, Photoshop tip here. A lot of people since, you know, remember years ago Kodak and Fuji came out with the super saturated films and all that. Everyone loves super saturated colors. If you oversaturate your colors, you're going to lose definition in those saturated areas. What I like to do is I hardly ever use saturation. I use the vibrance control in Photoshop Lightroom and Aperture because when you use the vibrance control, what you're doing is you're saturating the colors that are not already saturated. Also placing the subject off center helps. So this is the uh, flash shot. So we're driving around, as I said in the video, we found this place, I like to keep it simple. Travel with one light, a soft box, a couple of reflectors, a couple of diffusers. The main thing about lighting, as my friend in the back, Keith, knows, the most important thing about lighting is this. The larger the light, the softer the light. The next thing is, it sounds backward, but the closer the light, the softer the light. <laughs> so you want a big light, and you want the light very close to the subject. Again, it sounds backwards. You would think, oh, you light's further away, the light's going to get diffused, right? You want that light nice and close to your subject. I'm using my Canon 5D Mark II on this, and I'm using the Canon wireless transmitter, the STE2. Again, if you have any questions about this, please ask. Outside, <coughs> we were in the shade, the STE2 works fine. In bright sunlight, what you need is a more powerful transmitter. So I use the, can I use the pocket wizards. You know the pocket wizards? They're they work in very bright sunlight. They also work further than the Canon SDE2. So I'm always prepared with both. So we had the model pop into the scene. You saw in the video, David popped into the scene. I'm testing the shot before the model comes in because I don't want to waste the model's time. So on the right here, you see the flash shot. On the left, you see the natural light shot. If you're writing stuff down, this is a good thing to write down. It's not my original tip, but I got it from someone else. But I think about it a lot when I'm shooting. Light illuminates, shadows define. <clears throat> light illuminates, shadows define. It's the shadows that add definition to the scene. Also a little bit of drama. So over here on the left we have the natural light shot and on the right this is the flash shot. So I said in the video I don't want my flash pictures to look like a flash picture. It doesn't really look like a harsh flash picture with the harsh shadow because I have that flash and all these pictures, by the way, are on my blog, but you're more than, more than happy to take pictures. It's really fine. Um, the flash is softened, so we have this nice shadow that add this, adds a sense of depth and dimension. So you really need those shadows to add that sense of depth and dimension to your pictures. However, nice, sometimes a nice natural light shot is nice. One of my photography tips is, when I'm photographing people, see eye to eye, shoot eye to eye. Because when you see eye to eye, when you shoot eye to eye, the person looking at your photograph can relate more to the subject because they're looking right at eye level. However, break that rule <laughs> because what I did here is I got down a little below eye level. And when you do that, if you look at the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, you see the photographers a lot of times they shoot from a little bit below eye level. It gives the model a greater sense of uh, power. Another tip here is my best Photoshop tip is when you're working in Photoshop or Aperture or Lightroom, think selectively, don't think globally. In other words, there'd be no reason to sharpen this entire picture. You would want to sharpen the, models, the model more so than the background. If you sharpen the background, not as much attention is going to go towards the subject. I sharpened her face more than her dress and more than her body. You always want to think selectively rather than globally. If there's a lot of shadows in your picture, what's going to happen is if you sharpen globally and you have the shadows, 
all that noise is going to show up more so in the shadow areas than in the highlight areas. And I have some other examples of that in here. This is why one of the greatest features in Photoshop CS5, it was in 4.2, I believe, was when you go to filter, you can convert to smart filter. Because when you do that, see a couple of people shaking their heads, when you do that, what you can do is you could, you could apply your sharpening as you would an adjustment layer and a layer mask, masking in and out the stuff. If you have any questions on how to do this, maybe in elements, ask, because I can tell you how to do that also. So here's another tip when it comes to photographing people. We talked technical so far, now we'll talk philosophical. Here's the tip. Dave has heard me say this a million times in the last 10 years. What's the tip that the camera? The camera looks both ways. The camera looks both ways. In picturing the subject, you're also picturing a part of yourself. Meaning that, you know, the mood, the energy, the feeling, the emotion that you're projecting, that's going to be reflected in the subject's face and in the subject's eyes. So if you remember that, that the camera looks both ways, the camera sees both ways, another way to say that is that we're all mirrors. If we realize that, we'll get the reaction out of the subject that we want, meaning we'll get a higher percentage of pictures that we like. Here, we started out, we were shooting right, David, we're just going for like this, you know, the fashion shot, whatever. And then I said, okay, let's have some fun. So I changed my mood and the model changed to mood. So we got a total different reaction. And I think about this whenever I'm traveling all over the world. And I have some other people pictures I think in here from around the world. Remember that that is the most important thing because it's the feeling that is the most important thing in a picture. I'm sure you watch, well, I'm not sure. Some of you I'm sure have seen MTV, VH1, fashion magazines. A lot of the models are photo, the photographer uses what's called the disequilibrium effect, also called the Dutch effect where they're turning the camera down to the left or to the right to create a sense of disequilibrium in the picture. It makes the picture look a little more, it makes the picture look a little cooler. So try this when you're photographing people. My friend Dr. Dick Zakia wrote a great book. This is on my website, just go on the book page, I think it's still there. It's called Perception and Imaging. Perception and Imaging. And in that book, one of his tips, he says, use your camera like a spaceship. In other words, tilt it to the left, tilt it to the right, move it up, move it down, move it all around. You, if you do that, and don't get locked into, like everyone else, you know, Times Square today, you know, if you go through there, they're just standing there like this, or almost everyone, probably young people will you know, have their cameras down like this. Uh, and so try, try that disequilibrium technique. You'll get uh, pictures with a lot more energy. Again, placing the subject off center. The reason you want to place the subject off center, because as my friend Keith knows in the back also, dead center is deadly. If you place a subject in the dead center of the frame, what happens is that your eyes get stuck on the subject. If you place a subject off center, your eyes go around the frame. Now I break that rule, I break all the rules all the time, as you should. So think about that. So thinking about the end result, right? I work in Photoshop, but I also use a lot of plugins. This is called the Polaroid <laughs> transfer effect. I like this in Nick Color Effects Pro. How many people here use plugins? Okay. How many people here use Nick, the Nick plugins? Okay. Nick, you can get a discount on these on my plugins page, by the way. I think the nice young lady in the front, you got the, 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 some of the uh, discounts, right? Yeah. So you ordered what? Color Effects Pro? You got the whole, well, you could save a bunch. On, you could save a bundle if you order a bundle. And here's the antique photo effect. So play around with plugins. You could get to the same place with these plugins in Photoshop, in Lightroom, in Aperture, but it might take a half hour. So you spend what, whatever these things are, $79. It just saves you tons of time. That's what plugins do. Uh, most of them you could create the effect in Photoshop, Lightroom, and Aperture, but again, it's just faster to use these. Okay, black and white photography. When we're photographing people, now sometimes I like creating the end result, again, seeing the end result, creating a black and white. When we take the color out of a scene, we take <coughs> out some of the reality, right? When we take out some of the reality, our pictures can become more artistic, more creative. This is one of the reasons why Ansel Adams, anyone here not ever hear of Ansel Adams? Young people? No, everyone knows? I was teaching a workshop in Maui, and I was talking about the Beatles. There was a person in the audience who'd never heard of the Beatles, I swear to God. I said, I'll give you $100 if you can name one of the Beatles. 
Couldn't do it. <laughs> anyway, when we take the color out of the scene, we take out some of the reality. So if you want a more creative picture, try removing the color or just taking out some of the color. This is taken with the Canon 70 to 200 millimeter f2.8 lens at 2.8 because I really wanted to blur the background. The background can make or break the shot. Here we use the busy background. For this picture, I use my favorite. I use my favorite lens for people photography. My Canon 24 to 105 millimeter image stabilization lens. And the reason I like that lens is because I like to work close to the subjects. If the background's distracting, I will use the telephoto lens. But in most cases, I like to use, I like to use that uh, 24 to 105 so I can work close. Well, yes. what, what the image stabilization does is it lets you shoot at a slower shutter speed so you would get a sharper picture than if you were using a slower shutter speed because it lets you, it really stabilizes it. I've shot that 70 to 200 at a 15th of a second and gotten a really sharp shot in low light. Oh, it's amazing. The image stabilization lenses are, are totally, they're, they're amazing. And the, the reason I like the 24 to 105, getting back to that, by the way, is because I can work close. And here's something else in people photography, that the closer you are to the subject, the more intimate the picture becomes, right? Because someone looking at the picture feels as though they're there. So here I'm closer, here I'm not as close. So this picture doesn't have that same sense of intimacy because I'm not as close. If you want to really get good people pictures, go through National Geographic. I just canceled my print subscription to National Geographic because I'm getting it on the iPad now. I mean, things have changed so much. I mean, it's amazing. But mo a lot of those pictures of people are taken with lenses in that range. Yes, sir. Well, the ISO, it depends on the lighting. On the lighting. I'm always trying to shoot at the lowest possible ISO so I get the least amount of noise. But with a 5D Mark II, with a 7D, outside you can shoot at ISO 1000, you're not going to see any noise or grain. But on that note, Say you're inside here and you have to boost it up to ISO 3200 and you're going to get some noise. That happens, think about what my father used to tell me, that if a picture's so boring you notice the noise, it's a boring picture. So, and also what would you rather have? You know, a sharp picture or a blurry picture with not much noise? And on that note, one of the best features, I'm going to get to the question in one second, one of the best features in the new Lightroom and the new Photoshop CS5 is the noise reduction feature, Aperture 2. It's amazing what we can do now, reducing the noise and still getting a very clean looking picture. Yes? No, I'm always shooting in color. Because if you shoot in black and white, and David is going to talk about this too, he shot with the T2i. You want to jump in here and talk about, you know, if you shoot, if you put those picture styles in, what do they call it in the movie? Baked in? Is that the culture? Yeah, term? They're, they're, they're baked in, and then you're stuck with them. So if you want to go back, you can't go back. And that's why. If you're shooting color and you want to make it uh, black and white, that's the best way to do it. And it sort of falls into also the type of the quality of the video you shoot. You always want to shoot the best possible quality 1080 that you can shoot because from there you can always go down. It's the same thing with photography. Get the best shot you can and then muck with it later. That's the way to do it. Yep. And to get the best black and white, I use Nick, color of Nick Silver Effects Pro. Uh, all my friends, I don't know one pro who doesn't use Nick Silver Effects Pro to get the best black and white. But in, uh, in uh, Final Cut Pro, it's easy to remove the color, create yeah. the great black and whites. Yes, Good. former workshop student from Croton on Hudson, New York. Yep. Well, changing the ISO won't help you with the focus. Uh, if I'm going to take a picture in here, which right now, which is relatively dark, what I would do, because I don't want it to look so much like a flash picture, is I'll, I'll put it at ISO 1000 to start with, because the higher the ISO, the more room light comes in. So I'm going to try to shoot at a high ISO, going to try to shoot at a relatively wide aperture, so even without the flash, I would get some light coming in. If I'm shooting at a low ISO and, and a small aperture, and I took a picture, the, the image on the camera might be black. So I'm always trying to get some available light in that lens in addition to the flash. Well, focus, yeah, that's because the cameras today use uh, use contrast to focus, but a lot of these cameras uh, have focus assist beams, and on this, uh, on this camera, and this is the Canon 580 uh, EX flash, if you look up here, it, it's projecting this, this little beam, you can see it better on this wall for some reason. You see this beam over here? So, let me go up here, there you go. 
So it projects that, that beam or that series of lines to help with the focus. That's exactly, that's exactly what that's for. The autofocus takes care of Yeah, you could hear it. Let me see. You hear it? So that, that's a good thing. Uh, most, uh, even midline flashes have that. Uh, yeah. The question is what if you uh, don't want to use the flash? Well, you could use a focusing beam like I just did, then turn off the flash, put your camera back on manual focus, and, and do that. So that's actually a, a good technique. Never thought of that. That's why I love teaching these things. You learn, you learn stuff. So anyway, a nice black and white picture. Also, you see this is actually a flash shot. Look at the catch light in her eyes. Catch light makes the subject's eyes come alive. So I'm trying to add catch light with the flash. I'm trying to add catch light with the reflector. I'm having the subject just look at the light. Catch light is so important. I'm sure you've seen movies where a girl and guy are on the beach, right? The guy has tried every line. The girl's here. He's tried every line. No line's working. And it's a moonlit night. So he finally says to the girl, darling, your eyes sparkle. Well, that sparkle he's talking about is the catch light in the eyes. So try to add that catch light with the flash. Even, you know, reduce your flash output to minus three, even if you don't need any flash, just to get a little bit of uh, catch light. Just a couple of other shots from this uh, fashion shoot we did out in uh, Lake Powell a few years ago. I hate leaf blowers. How many people here follow my blog? I put. Thank you very much. Follow the blog. There's new stuff on there like every day. There's information on these uh, sheets here. I put something out there over the weekend. I said, I think the worst invention, not counting a weapon, <laughs> is a leaf blower, especially up in Crote, right? It's yeah, insane. It's but anyway, this is actually a good uh, use of a leaf blower. We're out here. We had a big reflector, you know, filling in all the shadows here. It was a very bright day. And we had the leaf blower, you know, blowing the model's hair. Nice little uh, accessory. But glamour, these fashion shoots, these aren't always like so glamorous. They're just a little behind the scenes shots. This is very important. Whether you're talking about photography, whether you're talking about shooting Movie video, yep. whether you're talking about producing an app, whether you're talking about your career, your life, your children's, whatever. This is the most important thing I think you think about and it's setting goals. As David knows, my son is a very goal-oriented person. He set a goal to get into a good school. He got into a good school. I'm a very goal-oriented person, which is why I have a few books and the apps and stuff like that. Here's the thing about setting goals applying to this picture. I was teaching this workshop in Mongolia, and we went to this show here. This is a show. This is amazing. Once a year, 500 soldiers from the real Mongolian army get dressed up like the soldiers from Genghis Khan's time and they put on this show. So they're riding around in this field. Everyone who photographs running horses wants to get this shot because all the hooves are off the ground, right? So I set the goal to get that shot. So in my hotel room, I'm thinking about this. What, what do I have to do to get the shot? What do I have to do to reach that goal? Well, I had to use a fast shutter speed, a thousandth of a second. I had to use rapid frame advance. I had to use uh, focus tracking, AI servo focus on my camera, which tracks the subject right up until the moment of exposure. I had to have a clear background. I had to be in the right place for the light. I had to take a lot of pictures, and I needed a great subject. So I went through that list of goals so many times before we got on site. Got on site becomes point and shoot photography because it's in your mind. And that's, what, that's what's so important about setting goals. You have to know how to use your camera. You have to know how to uh, use your camera in the dark. Take pictures. Does everyone here take a picture every day? You don't have to raise your hand if you don't. But my guess is some people here don't take pictures every day. If you take a picture every day, this will help you understand your camera, which is the first point in, uh, in um, setting goals. So anyway, I'm out in California. I, I was in Mongolia, got the shot. Then I was teaching a workshop out in Los Osos, California. We're going to photograph horses running on the beach the next day. I go through the litany of what you have to do. Tell everyone, guys, you got to set the goal to do it. So we go to the beach, becomes point and shoot photography. Everyone got the shot. It's very, very important to set goals. Getting away from the lighting here because all this stuff is very, very important too. You know, you can read about most of this stuff for free on the web. But I, like, I really like this part of the presentation where I talk about the four levels of learning. 
But before I talk about the four levels of learning, I'm going to ask David Levine, who are your two favorite guitar players? And you'll see why this applies. Um, Jimi Hendrix. Hendrix, okay. And uh, Dwayne Allman. And Dwayne Allman. Two dead, two dead guys. Two dead guys. Two dead guys. <laughs> okay. Person for name of your favorite uh, uh, pianist, piano player, piano player, or guitar Billy player. Joel? Billy Joel, right? He was actually a lot of people don't realize what an incredible piano player Billy Joel is. Okay, so here's how this is going to play into this. If Hendrix, who's still alive by the way, right? <laughs> if Hendrix, Dwayne Allman, and came back from the dead, and Billy Joel were, were up here, and they had their instruments going here, right? And they were jamming. And I, like, I would name Santana and Clapton. I love Santana. Okay? And I'll just talk about one person at a time, Santana. If Santana was jamming with these guys, he would not be thinking about what note he's playing, how hard he's playing that note, how he's bending the note. He's not thinking about what note he played, what note he's going to play, how he's using his pedals, and using his finger to uh, you know, bend the note and maybe even bending the neck to get these incredible tones out of one note. He's just doing it, right? And that's actually on the next slide, the fourth level of learning. And that's the level that we really want to get to. But to get to that level, the first level is the unconscious incompetence. We don't know we're not that good. We get a digital camera. We get a video camera. Hey, I'm pretty good, right? Get some shots on the back. Well, then you get to the second level, the conscious incompetence. We know we need help, which is why a lot of people go on workshops, buy apps, uh, read books and stuff like that. The third level, the conscious competence, which is a very good level. We know we're good. And that is really a good level. And the way to get there is by practicing. But the fourth level, this is the coolest level. This is, I'm going to call this the Hendrix level, the uh, Dwayne Norman level. The unconscious competence, where we just do it. And again, the more you do this, the better you get at it. How many people here read the book Outliers? Write this down. This is a great book, Outliers. What the author talks about is that all successful people have one thing in common. Guess what it is? Ten thousand. Who said that? So you did read the book, or you heard about the book? Yeah, yeah. So he, what the person in the front says, ten thousand hours of practicing. And that's it. He came up with this somehow or other. He did so much research, it was 10,000 hours. So he talks about in the beginning, actually, the Beatles. You may think, oh, the Beatles were just discovered. Doesn't he talk about in that book the hours they played? They played from 8 o'clock at night to 4 in the morning. Hey, what am I going to do? Oh, I, oh, bloody, you know, <laughs> so stuff like that came up. So you really have to practice a lot. Side lighting. This is called like Rembrandt lighting, the picture of my dad here. Nice natural light shot. Light coming in from the side, light coming in from the side. Natural light, same thing here. These are natural light pictures. When I'm taking a shot like this, they look, I, I'm, I think we forgot to set the resolution here where it got messed up or whatever. It looks pretty pixelated. But anyway, the light's coming in from the side here. When I'm doing a shot like this, I'm setting my camera on aperture priority, and I'm reducing the exposure compensation to a minus a half because all those shadows are going to fool your camera's exposure meter and the bright part of the scene would be overexposed and washed out. This actually is the same lighting system I used for the opening shot of the, of the girl in the red dress against the busy wall. One light. One light in a softbox fired remotely with the Canon STE2 uh, transmitter. I'm talking about envisioning the end result. Here's the original shot, crop, increase the saturation here. What was my most important Photoshop tip? Selectively. Think selectively, right. This mirror was old and dirty, so what I did is I selected, I used the oval, uh, I moved out of the light, sorry, for a cameraman there. Uh, I used my oval marquee, right, and I circled the mirror. I increased the sharpness, the brightness, the contrast in the mirror. I increased the saturation and the sharpness in her dress. I didn't touch the background. So thinking selectively is really important. Talk of, yes? Can you touch on how you selectively focus? Selectively focus? I'm, I'm sorry, selectively sharpen. Yeah, yeah. So talk about, okay, so say here's my shot cropped. The question is could you talk about how I personally selectively, do you have Photoshop CS5? I do. 
Okay, so what you do is, here's your shot, unsharpened. All raw files need sharpening, by the way. JPEGs come out of your camera, they've been sharpened, the contrast has been increased, the saturation has been increased. Okay. Here's how I do it in Photoshop. Anyone have elements here? Okay, so I'll just talk about how to do it in Photoshop. You go to... F yes. Right after this, I'm going to do that because if you don't have... You could do the same technique uh, in other programs too for elements. So, Photoshop. Here's your shot. Go to Filter. Convert for Smart Filter. Okay? So, when you do that, nothing happens over in your Layers palette here. Okay? But, when then you go to Filter, Unsharp Mask, and you apply sharpening to your main subject, when you click OK, you actually see a layer mask next to your subject. And then you could mask in, ma paint in, paint out the effect. Okay, do you got it? If you don't, I'll have a tutorial on my website on, by the uh, next couple of days. Okay? So elements, an easy, an easy way to do it is, where's the element user? Here's your picture, and you can do this in Photoshop too. Here's your picture, right? Sharpen the whole thing. Actually, sorry, duplicate the image so you have one on top of the other, right? Sharpen the whole thing, and then just your, or use your eraser tool and erase around the area you don't want sharpened. It's faster and easier than doing it, but you could do it in Photoshop. However, Scott Kelby would kill you because he would say that you're never supposed to erase pixels, but it works. And actually, to digress for a minute, because he's been smiling now, you need this kind of feedback when you're, when you're giving a, a presentation. I'll just show you very, very quickly how to do it, because I'm sure... Uh, I'm sure there are other people who want to... So, oh, it's going to take a second, because Photoshop wasn't open. Well, we're just waiting for this to open. David's going to be starting in about uh, 20 minutes. Does anyone have any questions? I know I talk so fast it's hard to get questions in, but does anyone have any questions so far on lighting? Yes, we have two, three maybe. Go ahead. Um, you do a lot of explanations about people, but I would like to take a shot and also to do that and make that that silver wire. Yep. When I'm, how do you focus the light so that you don't get that? Light? That's another presentation, my dear. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yes, next. <laughs> yeah, the only filter I, I use on site right now is a polarizing filter. I would envision the end result. I would set my exposure in that case so the highlights aren't overexposed and washed out, which is how I always set my exposures. I don't want those highlights overexposed and washed out. And I would envision how I would use the shadow, for example, the shadow highlight filter in Photoshop Light, Lightroom or Aperture to either tone down the highlights or open up the shadows. Was there another question? Yeah. Yeah, for those indoor shots. I don't tend to gel the flash because you do the same uh, thing in Photoshop. Again, working selectively, I can make the background warmer or whatever. This right. will just uh, and you can't ungel. And you can't ungel. Uh, so this is just going to take a second. So you see, just take a look. Filter, convert for smart filter, and look over here. You see over here the layers palette. You see the layers palette. Mm -hmm. So you go to filter, convert for smart filter. Nothing's happened over here except you have this little uh, icon there. Now, I'm going to over sharpen this, okay? So, you could just see the effect, okay? It's going to look terrible, but you're just going to see. So now, the whole thing's sharpened, right? right? You click on your layer mask down here. Black is the foreground color. Do your paintbrush and see now. So, I'm now I'm now the whole thing is the whole thing is that I was able to selectively sharpen just the subject. Okay? Was that the price of admission, which was free? Okay. It's worth it. It's worth it. Okay. Okay, let's talk, get back to simple lighting before David uh, comes on here. <laughs> Again, so here it looks like it's snowing in the back. 
But I, you know, if you looked at this, you'd see we have a nice black background. But this is that nice side lighting. Again, one softbox. What's going on here is this other softbox on top is turned off. We just have a reflector to the side of the subject. Here we have the reflector, you know, tilted towards the subject. So the light from the light is bouncing off the reflector onto the subject and filling in the shadows. How However, I like this shot more because it's more dramatic. The 1940s movie stars, they were photographed a lot with this type of look here. Are you using a speed light inside that softbox? Uh, this, no, this is actually, the question is, was it a speed light? This is one of the Westcott spider lights. We use these up at the workshops. The daylight balance fluorescent lights, which work uh, very, very well. So anyway, try to get that side light. Also watch for the catch light in the subject's eyes. I go through the magazine stands at the news uh, at the at the supermarket, and I see like eight lights in these models' eyes. It looks bizarre. It looks like they're from outer space. Keep it simple. One light, maybe two lights. Here, I had all these lights on with the reflector because I wanted a softer look. I wanted a softer look. So it really depends on the mood and the feeling that you want to uh, create. I'm going to zoom ahead to some people photography because I know David has a, a lot to. Uh, lot to talk about. Let's talk about this. This is true. And exposure is like a slice of pizza. I'm sure that you guys live in all different neighborhoods in New York City or New Jersey. Some folks came here. And you have your favorite pizza place, right? You have a favorite pizza place? What town do you live in? Um, Washington Heights. Washington. Anyone else live around Washington Heights? No. So what's your favorite pizza place? You don't even know the name, but it's your favorite. But how many pizza places are there about? 50, 20? On the same block. On the same block, okay. <laughs> so there's 10. So, but you go to the same place because you have your favorite pizza. Well, an expo slice of pizza. An exposure, I feel, is like a slice of pizza. Everyone likes something different. And this is really true. Take, here's an example. This is our friend, Andrea that David and I know. The picture on the left is actually, again, this looks too bright here. The picture on the left is actually the right exposure. The skin tone is right, the leather's right, the blue jeans right, but I like the picture on the right. I like the mood. It's about a stop darker. It's really what you like. Follow your heart. You have to follow your heart when it comes to an exposure. My wife, she likes pictures like the, on the left. She likes pictures a little light. I like pictures a little darker. I also uh, soften the picture a little bit on the right. The, again, it's the mood. The picture on the right has, it's more of a mood than the picture on the left. And you really must calibrate your monitor. I'm sure they sell dozens of different types of uh, calibration devices here uh, to calibrate your monitor. Uh, this is my monitor at home. I have a big, uh, big monitor here. If you don't calibrate your monitor, if your monitor is too dark, your prints are going to look too light. And the opposite. If it's too bright, your pictures are going to look too dark. And you want to have a neutral gray background. These squares are actually the same color. They're the same brightness. They look different because the background is different. Same thing here. They look different because the background's different. I teach workshops. People show up with sunset pictures as their background. They're working in Photoshop with a sunset or a green background or whatever. This is what's going to happen. You're not going to be able to see your colors correctly. You're not going to be able to see the brightness levels correctly if you don't calibrate your, your monitor. You know what? And after this, I'm going to let David go. And if we have time, you know, I'll come back. But this is a very important thing to think about, especially at the holiday season. If you, how many people here make their own prints? How many people send their prints somewhere? Okay, even, or even share their prints over the internet? Well, get this. If you drink Coca-Cola or coffee, it has caffeine in it, you're going to see colors differently than you would when you don't. It's, it's interesting. There's scientific studies. Same thing with alcohol. If you drink alcohol, you know, late at night, you're done work, you go home, you want to play with your pictures, you have a you have happy hour, your colors are going to look different. And you may wake up the next morning and say, what was I thinking? <laughs> so this is true. If you drink caffeine and alcohol, it's going to affect how your colors look. So the point here is don't drink in print. 
Not a bad, well, not a bad joke, right? <laughs> being tired. Being tired also affects how you see colors, and old age also affects how we see colors because we get this yellow film over our eyes. You know, there's stories of people who have cataracts, have the cataracts removed, and they think their eyes are bleeding because they see so much red in the scene. So what I'm going to go through here quickly is I want to show you um, a five-step workflow uh, flow process for shooting video. All right. Uh, it's a lot similar to photography, except it's a bear to manage, especially if you're doing a two minute, a three minute video. There's a lot of things to be thinking about. And Rick and I have been doing it for a number of years. So first I'll give you, oops, I'll go back. I'll give you a little bit of who I am. Uh, I directed, edited, uh, and directed programs and commercials for 25 years. I won an Emmy. I like to tell people it's before kids. Um, <laughs> Uh, I have an Apple consulting company and I'm co-owner of Rick's Pixel Magic with uh, Rick Salmon and we've done over 16 DVDs and 150 videos together. So we work very well together. We got a good working relationship going. Uh, we actually, it's like being in a band. We can finish mm. each other's uh, statements. Uh, I use Apple applications. So I'm using Final Cut uh, Studio 2. It's got Final Cut Pro, soundtrack for audio, motion, compressor. It's a bear of a program. Uh, you, it takes you, uh, there's a steep learning curve, uh, but once you get that down, then you can actually concentrate on making movies, just like when you uh, learn how your 5D works. You can start taking great pictures. It's the same thing with that. Uh, I also use Aperture 3 for our photos. Rick, uh, Rick uses both Lightroom and Aperture 3. Um, I use GarageBand for our music because you can't use other people's music if you're selling your stuff. I'll tell you a little bit of a story about that. Um, and then I use Keynote. And I use Keynote for all the graphics in the videos. It's a little known uh, trick, and it's a great way to uh, create uh, motion graphics simply, easily, and repeatable. So I use Keynote for that. I also use three other applications, third-party applications. Uh, Omni Outliner. Whenever Rick and I shoot or any project, you make an outline. And the outline is basically for our DVDs, it's the different chapters and what is in each chapter so you know what you need to shoot. This becomes the Bible. You carry that with you from start to finish. Um, I use a thing called Final Print in the edit itself, in the Final Cut edit. Now, I don't know if there's any editors here, so I don't want to go too deep, but Final Print actually helps you because in our videos we have uh, help, uh, not help, uh, information, uh, Rick's tips and all that is made in uh, Keynote, but I need to know where to put those things and what they should stay. So I use a program called Final Print. And then uh, OmniGraphle uh, is a uh, flow chart which we use for making our DVDs. So the five step process for shooting uh, is first brainstorm, organize, shoot, edit, and then distribute. So we'll start with uh, the brainstorm first. Basically, Rick and I are doing it together. You're doing it with any th anybody. You put a team together, and you want to decide why you're making a video. That's, the, that's one of the most important things, and it's the thing to always keep in the back of your mind. Why are you shooting? What's the end result going to be? So it, it could be for selling a product. could be for selling a service. could be for shooting a soccer game that your daughter is in or your son is in. Uh, it could be for a bar or a bat mitzvah if you're shooting, if you're a photographer and you're also shooting stills for that, weddings, um, you might want to also shoot video for that and uh, also for training purposes. The other thing to always keep in the back of your mind, like in photography, is who's the audience and, and what do they want? When you make a, a project, a video, and they watch it on a monitor or a computer screen and then turn it off, walk out of the room, what is it that you want them to walk out of that room with? It could be an emotion, it could be the desire to buy the product you're selling, but you always have to keep that in the back of your mind and it will help you when you're shooting always to make sure you're getting the correct stuff. Now organize. This is probably the biggest bear of the whole project. First of all, talent. Okay, is there on-camera talent in your project? You'll have to get releases for that talent. Okay, equipment. How are you? What are you going to use? What kind of camera? You're going to shoot in an HD SLR. You're going to use your 7D. You're going to use your 5D. You're going to use a 
high def video camera like a Sony HDV camera? What kind of camera are you going to use? What are you going to do with audio? Are you going to use wireless mics like we're uh, uh, wearing now? Rick and I use two wireless mics when we shoot so that Rick and the other person on camera, I can mix them each to a separate channel. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. And then, of course, what kind of cards you need, what kind of lighting accessories, what kind of uh, cassettes you're going to need. Shooting outline. That's the outline you made when you started your project. Always keep that with you. I use Omni Outliner, which is a product for the Mac. They don't make a Windows version. Uh, and then your schedule for shooting. You know, when you're going to shoot, is everything available? Who's available? The crew? Uh, who's doing the camera? Who's doing the audio? Uh, do you need an assistant on location? We use an assistant to help us carry the camera, to hold a reflector or a diffuser. Uh, so you need that. Locations, where are you going to shoot? If you're going to shoot someplace, do you need a release for it? So make sure you have a stack of releases when you go there or pre-select where you're going to shoot. And also, is the location you're shooting in fitting what your product is supposed to be, what the uh, uh, end result is and the audience that you're shooting for? Is the location that you're shooting the right place to be shooting? And of course, transportation which <laughs> we just pile in the car and go. Uh, but you'll need transportation for talent, for your crew, uh, and again, always keeping in the back of your mind why are you uh, making this video. And then when it comes down to the actual shoot, a lot of the things are the same. What kind of equipment are you using? Make sure you got everything that you're going to need because a lot of times you're on location, just like photography, and oh my God, I need that, and it's not in the car. Uh, you know, so that's, uh, you always got to think ahead that way. Locations, what's the weather like? There are a lot of times we go out, we can't shoot, it's too windy, uh, the sun's in the wrong direction, it's raining. Um, so you always have to keep that in mind also and make sure, again, you have releases. Transportation, talent and crew, shooting, same thing. Make sure you have your outline. Are you getting all your shots? Okay, and that's where the outline comes in handy. So you actually have to, when you're shooting, uh, when we go out to do a lesson, we know from start to finish what that lesson is supposed to be about and all the little pieces in between while we're shooting that's going to make up that video. So a video that we do could have 20 scenes in it or, you know, 10 inserts and then, you know, Rick starts on camera and we cut away. So you always have to have a list of those shots because you don't want to get back in the edit room and realize you were in Florida for three days, you shot all this stuff, and you're missing that one shot. So it's going to be difficult to do, especially if it's in the middle of the winter uh, in the east. So you always have to make sure you have your outline, you got all your shots covered, and shoot as much B-roll or cutaway material as you can. So if I'm going to cut away from Rick, Maybe I'll shoot a picture of his hand on the camera, so if I have to edit his audio, right, and he's on camera, I can cut the audio, but put a picture of the camera in there, and then cut back to him to cover the audio edit, so his head doesn't <laughs> jump like that, which, you know, sometimes happens. Uh, and again, always, is it working, and why am I making this video? In the edit room, when you have to put everything together, one of the most important things is follow your outline. But as Rick says, there are rules for shooting, but he breaks all the rules all the time. When you get in the edit room and you're looking at all this material you worked really hard to shoot, it may not work. It's not giving you what you're looking for. So you have to be able to sort of, uh, like a musician, riff in the edit room. And you might have to change a little bit of what you're doing to get the same result. So you have to be loose. You have to be ready to roll with the video. You have to keep track of potential changes. So if Rick and I are working together and Rick comes over and he looks at the video that we've just done, he might say, you know what, I don't think it's working this way. I think we need to reshoot. Uh, and so we'll look at like 10 videos at a time and we'll make notes to then go back and change what we need to change. But at least we have a record of that. For the app, this is where you make markers for graphics and your titles also. Uh, in the video so you know where to insert everything. And again, why are you making this video? And make sure at every step it's meeting your uh, criteria. And again, this is the stuff I use. Final Cut Studio. You can use Final Cut Express or iMovie. There are plenty of programs for the PC that work also. Uh, again, uh, for stills I use Aperture. For the music I use GarageBand. Um, 
and then for graphics, I use Keynote. Now, the thing about music, because every video you're going to do, you might want to put music in, and obviously, there's copyright issues. I worked on a video. The one I won an Emmy for was for, um, uh, it was called Shades of a Single Protein. It was done for Oprah uh, Winfrey's production company, and it was about racism in America. And the directors had spent uh, six months traveling car across country interviewing high school kids about all sorts of different racism, you know, whether it was uh, Asian, it was anti-Semitism, it was black, it was white, just interviewing high school kids to get all across the country. They ended up in L L.A. Uh, a day after the Rodney King riots had started. So we had all this great footage of them in L.A. with riots still going on and interviewing high school kids about it. We wanted to use for the beginning of the show a song called For What It's, for what it's Worth by the Buffalo Springfield. It's a great song. It is an anti-war song, but it has great lyrics. So we called the publisher up, right? They wanted $50,000 to use the song for the beginning of the show. So we said, you know what? We can't. We don't have the budget for it. So we, uh, one of the producer's friends was a music guy. He made basically what was a knockoff of, of For What It's Worth. It sounded sort of mm. like it, but it was completely original and rewritten. Next day, they bring it into the edit room. The phone rings. I pick up the phone. It's Stephen Stills, who wrote the song For What It's Worth. And he said, what are you guys doing? So I said, well, you know, we're putting together this thing about racism, yada, yada. He says, you can use the song for free. Okay. If we hadn't, Right, and we wanted to use it. You could get sued, and everything you've put together for this project is, you know, is in the toilet. That's why GarageBand is a great tool to make stuff, make your own music. And really, you have to think about it, because there are a lot of times YouTube won't play videos that have copyright material in it. If you're using YouTube as a marketing medium, uh, they're not going to play it. So it's something to uh, always keep in the back of your mind. David, yes, excuse sir. me, just speaking on uh, about music, don't you use um, some like service to download uh, music also? It's not, like I, I know iStock Music has it, but you use something else, don't you? Yeah, there's a ton of them. There's uh, a ton. There's a, a bunch of places if you put free audio loops in, you can download free music and use that also. Sound effects <laughs> are the same way. You can uh, use that. But GarageBand, if you have Final Cut Studio, Soundtrack Pro there, uh, Pro, there are tons of loops in those programs that you can then do your own mixing. And it's actually really simple, you know, put a bass line down, put a drum line down, make sure it fits, um, and it's a lot of fun. You did, did all the music for it. Yeah, so all the music is done in GarageBand for our stuff. Distribution. So I shoot at 1080. Um, 1920 by 1080, highest resolution right now for HD that you can shoot at. Um, that's because I then decide how we're going to distribute what we're doing. And there's a million different ways to distribute your product. SmugMug, which we're partnered with, has a great both for uh, photos and uh, HD video. They have both free and paid accounts. Uh, it's a great place to stream your stuff from. If you're going to uh, promote a project, you can put it up there and send people to it. Uh, Apple TV. Anybody have an Apple TV here? Okay, good. Apple TV, if you have iTunes, whether you're on Windows or you're on a Mac, you can stream your iTunes library to your Apple TV. The new Apple TV that's out now allows you to stream videos from your iPad and your iPhone directly to your television, your high-def television, without wires. It's very, very cool. So one of the things that Rick and I are doing in addition to the app is we're selling a DVD that has the videos on it that you can transfer to your iPad, okay, outside of the application and stream it directly to the TV in your living room so you can watch it that way. And the resolution is, is phenomenal. Amazing. It's really good. Uh, so there's the Apple TV, there's YouTube, there's the DVD. Yesterday's technology today is the DVD. Uh, iPhone video, the same thing. You can put video through iTunes on your iPhone and, of course, the iPad. Now, just quickly, taking that, this process here that we did that I used to shoot videos, this is how we made our app. The same thing. First thing we did was we thought about uh, how are we going to make this app, right? <coughs> Why? Why did we want to make one? Well, the simplest thing is we wanted to make it because uh, we want to make money. Ha! That's a simple, that was easy. Uh, what kind of content do we have? Now, we had a ton 
of lighting videos. There are, I think there's 21 videos on the, in the yeah. app, but we probably have close to 40 videos over the course of our DVDs that we've shot that specific to lighting or exposure. So we knew what content we wanted, but we had an issue because we didn't have the rights to the content. Okay, the content rights were owned by Wiley Publishing, who's we use DVDs uh, uh, that we um, we author for them and that they sell to Canon. However, so what we needed to do was we needed to make sure that we got the rights, and uh, we were uh, very fortunate because Wiley gave us the rights uh, to our videos to use specifically for the iPad. Next thing you're going to need to think about is a developer. Who's going to develop your iPad app? All right, you need somebody who writes the code. That's important. It's one thing to put all the content together. It's important to know how it's going to work. You need somebody who can actually do the coding. Uh, we found somebody, I found somebody through our Apple list, Craig Ellis. Uh, he's a great guy, did a great job for us. So you need a developer. Again, the same thing. Who's your audience? And in our case, who is going to watch this uh, iPad app? Is it an amateur? Is it a pro? Um, and do we make an iPad, an iPhone, and an iTouch version? Or do we do just an iPad version? What versions do we do? What we did, we started with an iPad version, and we got feedback from people who said they wanted an iTouch and an iPhone version also. Okay? So we then went ahead and we made uh, versions for that. You can actually make one version for both, but what we did was in order to have a lower price point for the iTouch and the iPhone, we made a scaled down or light at light version of the application. Organize. It's the same thing for the shooting because we shot the video that gets inserted there. Uh, app development. You have to join Apple Developer Connection, okay? Now, you don't have to do it specifically. Rick and I did so that our company would be the ones who are publishing. So when it shows up in the iTunes store, it says our name. But also, the most importantly, Apple pays us directly. So Apple takes 30%. I don't know if everyone knows how this works, but Apple takes 30%, and the rest of the sale comes to us that's deposited monthly into our account. Um, let me skip ahead here. Timeline, again, for the development. So Rick and I knew we needed to have uh, stuff ready at certain points to start to send to the developer to start building it. And actually, from start to finish, it only took us about two months from the time we decided to do it to the time it was up at the Apple Store. And the Apple approval process, uh, oh, I'll talk about this in a second. Apple approval process is about two weeks. So once you submit it, uh, it usually takes about two weeks for them to approve it and then it shows up uh, on, in the store and a sale. And the cool thing is, is it's everywhere. It's the whole world. The first day that this, it went live, it went live 11.30 one night. Between 11.30 and uh, 12, we sold, I think, 28 copies all over the world. It wasn't just the United States and Canada. It was in Singapore. It was in Russia. It was in China. It was, and, you know, we don't no advertising there. Go ahead. Do you get sponsorships or funded? No, we no, we don't have any ads in it. We were ta actually talking about that on the way down. No, there's no sponsorship. We uh, we, uh, we did our own. Uh, we underwrote the whole thing ourselves. But the truth was, it really what we already had the videos. So the only thing we were doing was our time. We paid the model and the uh, the makeup and uh, lighting and that little piece you saw. We made a deal with the developer instead of paying the developer outright. We gave him a percentage of the app. So he wrote the app that way, and it worked out. Our challenge also was video, especially if you're putting video in an application. Do you stream it, or do you include it? Okay. Now, we have 21 videos. Uh, they're huge file sizes. So we could stream the video, right, which would mean that anytime you wanted to watch a, a video, you were at the mercy of either your Wi-Fi connection or your 3G connection, right? So we decided... Um, and we've got very, very little negative feedback about it. We included all the videos. So when you buy the app, the iPad app, it's almost, I think it's almost three gigs in size. Actually, I think it's just under three gigs. It takes a while to download, but all 21 videos you now have in this app in high definition on your iPad. So you don't have to wait for it or anything. 
one, one, someone complained about how long it took. And again, you know, you're sort of at the mercy of your connection to the internet and how slow or fast iTunes, the iTunes store is that day. But in general, it takes about 40 minutes to download the app. And only one person complained about it. So. You went live at 1130 p.m. That I have no idea. Were Absolutely. You on my blog? Well, yeah, we had done some pre. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty into social media marketing, so I have about ten thousand followers on Twitter, so I put it on there. Put it on Facebook. I put it on my blog. But in answer to his question, we didn't know the the exact time it was going to go oh, yeah. out. We had already laid some groundwork mm -hmm. for that it was coming out. But you know, all of a sudden we got an email from uh, Apple. I mean, they keep you in the loop. And then we got an email as your app is now live, right? And we looked at 12, because they only track by day. So when we looked for the next morning, when we saw that it went live, when we looked, they only had 11.30 to midnight because that ended the day. But we did know, on that one, we did know, you know. Well, I think we did 28, 29, I don't remember, something like in a half hour. All over the world. It just was like, you know. Well, of course, he's known all over the world, too, so. Price, you got to think about how much you're going to charge for your app, you know, and a lot of that has to do with how much effort you put into making it, obviously, how much you want to get back. And the pricing thing is a little weird. Um, I think for the iPhone and the iTouch, it's pretty simple. It's either free or 99 cents. I think most people will buy it that way. For the iPad, what's happening, at least in our, um, our um, what, tracking, is that the iPad is now seems to be more for learning. Uh, and training people a lot of people are willing to pay you know fourteen ninety nine ten ninety nine for an application that's going to give them a wealth of information on a particular subject whether it's playing golf or cooking so you have to think about what you're going to charge and the truth is we came out of the gate with what we felt was a, a fair price which I think was eight ninety nine uh, we then decided that well you know sales were were good. But we figured, well, let's lower the price and see what happens. So we lowered the price. The first day we lowered the price, boom, sales went up. And then it went right back to the same way it was when it was $8.99. So now we had to sell twice as many to make the same thing as $8.99. It didn't affect it at all. One day surge in it. So um, you have to think about your price and uh, go with it. But basically on the iPad, I think the pricing is between $4.99 all the way up to $69 I've seen on the applications. Yep. Yeah, what sort of, are the applications only usable on the iPhone or are they compatible with Android? Or no, we're not doing Android. No, we've not done any Android yet. There are a number of issues. I know, I think Rick wants to do some. There's some development issues with Android because without getting too crazy is that there are different versions of Android operating system and not all applications, you have to decide which one you're going to develop for because they're not going to work on all of them. Plus the carriers add their own stuff to uh, the phones that carry Android. So we stuck with Apple for right now um, and uh, we'll see how everything shakes out. Now Verizon's going to be starting to carry the iPhone. Verizon carries the iPad also. Uh, Best Buy and, <coughs> and uh, Target are carrying the iPad so the, the reach is getting out there which is great. Because don't forget, this will work on any iOS device. I don't know if your developer's not here, but can you say anything about the Google Oh, yeah, I'm going to show you that real quick. I'll go through his presentation. Um, when you created the iPad version, do you have to pay every time you get an application out? Apple, do you have to pay Apple? No. You join the Apple Developer yeah. Connection, $99 for the year. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. Yeah, you don't have to pay. Anytime you do an update, doesn't cost you anything. You just submit it to the App Store and then you go through the process. Now, in order to build the app, just like anything, like Rick was saying, visualize what you need to see. We needed to create a flow chart that would reflect um, what it was going to look like. And that's what you do during the organizing section. And again, we had to do our shoot, so we went through all the stuff you normally see in the shoot. And then in the edit session, uh, follow the outline. You got to be ready to change. And we did a couple of changes in the um, when we were editing the girl video. We did we 
fooled with the audio. We decided we were going to insert uh, the shots from the iPad and also the iPhone. There's an iPhone version. But at this point also is when you decide to create your graphics. Because obviously there are graphics in the iPad app, and I'll show it to you real quick, some of them. Um, you have to make picture sizes. Because in ours, there are galleries of the pictures. There are different thumbnails. There's a thumbnail that's on the screen. And when you touch on it and it comes full screen, that's a different picture, uh, even though it's the same picture. So there's a lot of things to uh, track. Apple's very good to give you all the outline and what things need to be, what sizes they need to be. So if you belong to the developer connection, they have great tools for that. Um, oh, and also our app icon. Right? We yeah. had to pick an icon, the one that shows up on the store that everyone sees. Uh, we had to do that also. Uh, the next big thing, if you're interested, for people who edit, compression. We had a, we had a decision now because we had 21 videos that are high def. How are we going to fit them? Apple recommends uh, under 3 gigs for an application. How were we going to, because it was almost 6 gigs worth of video, so we had to fool around with the compression and Final Cut and compressor to get the down to the size that you needed to have it. So these are two different compression schemes that you can see. If it, the one on the left is the original one, which is 1.36 gigs for one movie, right? You see it where it's circled? Using a different compression scheme, we were able to cut that uh, basically in half. So I had to fool around with that, and there, there's a lot of information on the web. But a lot of this was trial and error to get it to uh, come down in size. This is Compressor, which is part of Final Cut Studio. So once you edit a video, you then say, OK, move it to Compressor and make it into the format that you want. What's up still compression? I'm sorry? Like this photo is a still. Right. Uh, do you compress that before? How, how much? Oh, no. The images were not, were not compressed. I mean, they were resized. They were all JPEGs. So they are compressed that way, but we started with RAW to begin and just resize and save them as JPEGs. We didn't really do anything other than that. Yeah. Yeah, the images actually ended up being the small. This was the video, which you already saw. Hey, I'm Rick. So we'll go to the next one. So when we decided we were going to do the app, we needed to make a flow chart. Okay, so I use OmniGraffle because you got to visualize what this thing is going to look like. I mean, if you want to cede all control to your developer, you can do that. But, you know, Rick and I like to keep some control so that it looks like up to our standards. So this, I created this in uh, OmniGraffle, which is a flowchart program. So you can see it's pretty close to um, what it actually ended up being. If you look at the top screen, the splash screen, what you'll learn video getting started over here. And then here are what the categories ended up to be like they are over there. So I gave this to the developer so that he had a place to start so he could start working on it. And as you can see here also, uh, basics. Okay, there's the title. Here's the first video. This is the play button. This is the gallery button. See, it says picture gallery over there. And obviously, once it starts fitting the screen, we start working on stuff like that. And in Craig's presentation, I'll show you, we talk about coloring. Each category is colored so that visually you have a reference point. So for distribution, test the app. We test, we test, we retest, we test, because the last thing in the world you want to do, send an application to the store that gets approved, and something doesn't work in the app, and the negative reviews start piling up. Because you're going to get, you're not going to sell any. Because negative reviews, the more negative reviews, obviously the less you sell. You have to submit it for the app, to the app store for approval. Uh, it takes about two weeks, like I said. Um, then we get the marketing campaign going. App codes. We have some app codes we're going to give away. Uh, you get 50 app codes for every time you publish your app. They give you 50 codes that you can then give to the press or give to friends to uh, so they can get free copies of your app good for word of mouth. Track your app. There are two great ways to track your app. App Viz, which shows you uh, your sales, where it is, all over the world on a daily basis. And uh, iTunes Connect, which is part of the Apple Developer Connection. And that shows you, gives you all the information about your app. You know, where it's being sold, how much money you're making, 
uh, when they're going to pay you, all that sort of good stuff, your reviews, everything like that. And then plan your updates. You know, you start, as soon as you submit it to the store, start planning your updates. Because one of the things that generates sales for an application is when, you, if you've already bought it, an update comes out and you can get it again. A lot of people wait, you know, they don't buy the first generation or anything, they wait for an update. Well, updates help you, and when you do an update, you get more codes anyway to give away. So, some lessons learned. Reviews, negative and positive. You got to manage that to the best of your ability. Someone sends you an email that says, this is the greatest app I've ever seen. Nicely suggest them, well, Rick does it because they find, oh, an email from Rick Salmon, oh my. They'll republish the interview, the, their comments to the app store, you know, if it's a nice one. Negative reviews. Somebody doesn't like you, if you're a public figure like Rick, or you know, someone in your past doesn't like you, and they know you've got something done, they'll publish something, and they'll say, this is the worst piece of crap I've ever seen in my life. When in fact, you've got nothing but great reviews, some guy can publish it, there's nothing to stop him from it, and it gets published. So, you know, gotta look for the positive reviews, and there's a button also that says, review helped. So, you know, make sure people check that, that the review helped them buy the app. Um, support. You need to have a support structure in place when people call and say their app's not working, right? So we set up an email um, in the application itself that when someone doesn't like something or they have a suggestion from within the app, they can email us and they tell us. But if you get an email, you got to make sure somebody's in place. And in our case, Craig Ellis, who's our developer, is there to make sure it gets back to them within 24 hours. Because people start to get antsy, and the next thing you know, you got a negative review, because it took you too long. Even if you solve their problem, the review's already out there. So, timely manner, investigate. Because in a lot of cases, there are bugs that you haven't discovered, that someone else discovers, and then you'll fix it in the update. People love that, because they'll then republish a review uh, themselves to say, you know, I had this problem, and they were responsive, and they fixed it quickly. Pricing, limited time, perceived value, iPod is better. We sell, iPad is better. We sell three times as, as many of our application on the iPad as we do on the iPhone and the iTouch. And I think that's the same for all your other ones too, right? Sales, track and look for trends. You know, if it's selling in Russia for some other reason, you know, you see there's a million of them there. Why? What is it that's in the app that's making it sell in Russia and how can you leverage that? Um, and then... That's it. Dave and I, in our business, we're 50-50 partners. When I wanted to start the business, I said, hey, Dave, you want to be a partner? So I'm thinking, well, what should I do? 40, 20? I said, if I make him 50-50 partner, he's going to work as hard as I am. So we both work <laughs> the same, right? Yeah. So with the, with the app developer, I think you don't have to spend any money up front. I have three different app developers, and this is a very sophisticated app. If you saw in that movie there, there's a lot going on. Okay, if you wanted something like that, you're going to have to give the developer a larger percentage, maybe 20, maybe 30 percent, okay? But he's going to work hard for that, 20 or 30 percent. From uh, the first app I had, which came out, um, and I have this other app developer, and they're basically PDFs. I have a, an app on butterflies, an app on social media marketing, an app on... Uh, on, uh, what are some of the other ones I forget, underwater, something like that. Social and networking, did you say Social that? media, right. Yeah. These are basically PDFs, PDF apps. One advantage of having a PDF app is that no one can steal it. I used to sell PDFs on, on DVDs. So I, sell, I sold this PDF on a DVD of this, on social media with all these beautiful pictures with, uh, you know, with the famous quotes on them, okay? So I sell a DVD. This is a true story. Three weeks ago, I'm in Florida. A guy comes up to me and he says, you know, I was looking for the photographer who took the pictures on this PowerPoint presentation. I said, what are you talking about? He gets his computer. He has my pictures with the Celine in, in a PowerPoint presentation with, this, with Celine Dion singing the Titanic song. <laughs> so someone changed my PDF. But you could do this, right, into a PowerPoint. Right. So they stole my work. So one, one advantage of this is you can only do it on the app. But getting back to the first app, I'm in Maui. Uh, I'm in a helicopter, and we're going around on this photo tour at the Maui Photo Festival. 
So we jump out of the helicopter, and I asked the guy behind me, I said, man, that was so great, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, are you a full-time photographer? He said, no. I said, what do you do? He says, I'm an app developer. Okay? So I said, okay, I want to do the app. So we talked about it, and again, like this app, my other app, 24-7 uh, Photo Buffet, is very sophisticated at stills and movies and blah, blah. I said, what do you charge? He says, well, I could either charge you $50,000 or, or you could give me 50%. So I'm doing the 50% with them. Okay, so this book that I have up here, no more books for me. Apps, I'm only doing apps. This book on studio lighting costs 30 bucks here. In Australia, you see, pretty popular in Australia, costs $60. Who's going to spend $60 on a book in Australia because it has to be shipped there? The app's $5. Yeah. So we have this market, Australia, China, Denmark, other, this was taken a, a long time ago, but you have this worldwide audience that can download your product. You know, and you talked about the hour downloading, we could get out of that. Um, you know, you could download it while you're eating dinner or having happy hour or whatever. But you have, you have the worldwide market, which is just amazing to me that we could reach all these people. You, you really have to be involved in the social media and just, you know, get your friends to tweet about it, put it on Facebook. My mother told me when I was six, you never know who's watching. So put, it's true, right? Uh, in a lot of ways, it's true. And always wear underwear. And always wear underwear, <laughs> right. It changes socks. So you but, never know when you have to go to the hospital. So if you want it, right. She said that. So, make sure they're clean. And make sure they're clean. So anyway, uh, just get the stuff out there. Send it to people. You know, who knows? So I'm going to quickly go yeah. through this. If you guys don't want to see it, that's fine, because it's a little uh, detailed. Uh, again, these were, uh, just to come back, this is Craig's uh, awesome um, key design principles for great apps, and basically awesome content, intuitive user interface, great customer experience, and uh, talented teams. So that's the three of us. That's Craig, which you saw before. Um, okay. I'll, I'll I'll be happy to slow it down and uh, so basically awesome content, great customer experience, intuitive user interface experience and uh, delivered by a talented team and the application supports all that. Here's uh, some uh, as he calls them the Ten Commandments but there's more than of uh, iPad development. So you've got support all orientations, which is important in the iPad. Uh, don't just add features. Look at how people are going to interact with it. Um, flatten your information hierarchy so it's easy to find things. Context is important, but make that context easy to find. Um, full screen transitions. The smaller the transition, the smaller the application is, which is good. Um, He's got physical and heightened realism, stunning graphics. De-emphasize user interface controls. In other words, don't have so many buttons and, and things that need to be switched uh, or put into place or turned on for you to use the application. Our application is really simple. You touch something, you swipe, you touch it again, you can see it. You can do everything with your fingertip, which is the strength of the iPad. Um, User interface controls are minimal in our application. Um, I'm not sure what this one means, but uh, minimize modality. But um, rethink your lists, consider multi-finger gestures. These are all specific to the iPad. Uh, popovers, which we do have. Uh, file handling operations. You don't really want to store a lot of files um, because you, it's very difficult for the subsystem on the iPad to have storage on files uh, that an application has to uh, go to. So that's why you include everything in the application. Um, you don't want to really save anything because it should save it automatically, should be part of the application. It should start instantly. People hate waiting. I don't know if anybody's got the, uh, the USA Today app on their iPad, but it takes forever for that first page to load. Um, and then uh, always be prepared to stop. In other words, when you're in the middle of development and you want to stop it because you need to lock in the code, be prepared to do that. Yeah? Uh, I know it used to be restricted to access the recording video feature. 
That's correct. It's still that way. It's still that way. Yeah. Apple has private S, uh, APIs that you can't access, but they're slowly opening all that up. So um, when the iPad next comes out with a camera, I think you're going to see a lot of that. You're going to be able to stream the movies that you record to, uh, you know, your flat panel TV wirelessly. This starts to get a little into geek thing here, but uh, animations, um, gesture rich UI. Now, again, if you belong, the, the Apple Developer Connection has a free, you can join for free, and then you can have access to all sorts of white papers and examples of code and how to actually make an application. Uh, it's a great thing to do, and it touches on all these, you know, all which is part of uh, building an application. We have custom controls in our standard UI, which is um, Apple gives you those to use. Um, it's, a, it's a great thing. And you can, again, you can join for free and you can look to see everything that they have. <coughs> Here's a life cycle for the application. Uh, um, Technical, you want to go back? Okay. You know what? We could put these up on my blog, too. Oh, yeah. They Set up to shoot. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, technical references, again, these are all on the Apple Developer Connection site, and they teach you everything from Coca Touch, which is the uh, environment in which you develop in, what kind of media it supports, um, you know, core services and the core OS, the things you can access and you can't access when you're actually writing the code for the application. Um, <clears throat> and then these are all the uh, architecture highlights. This is really, <laughs> well, this is down there because you're using Object C to develop with. So uh, Rick will put this up. And then yeah, you we'll can put get all this. Better, stuff. You know, we'll, we'll make Craig. Uh, we'll make Craig narrate this. Yeah, okay? we'll make him narrate it. That's right. No, seriously, we'll do that in the next <sighs> within a month. So quickly, we met the intro screen, the the video that gets the original video that then gets inserted. You can see at the top there how it gets placed inside the application. This is the full screen version, and then how it gets embedded into the application itself. And then all the, oops, sorry. All the things, all the different components that each one of the sections, you know, lesson section, those are the categories next to it. And within each category, it's, uh, you know, the app, minimize app bundle size. That was what we did with the compression in Final Cut that you saw. So we made the files smaller. That's what he's talking about there. Um, Color-coded lessons, they're these small things that uh, you, know, you don't really think make a big difference, but they do when you're using it. Uh, the idea that everything is color-coded sort of makes you know that you're in a certain section. Uh, the other thing that we did was, when in the process of making the application, you can run it uh, on your device before it gets submitted. So we were able to, uh, Rick and I and Craig were able to test it continuously and sometimes he would be sending a new update for the app uh, every night uh, to test different things. And that's so we would go through it and say, you know what, this isn't right, that's not right. Um, and then, of course, in it, there's a section called Stay Connected with Rick, so it has all the stuff from Rick. These are components that we added. To, uh, about the authors, so we made this section, which you're going to want to have in there, uh, explaining about the app and how the app works, that's also in there. And then I was talking about the email feedback. We set up uh, support emails so that you can email directly from the application as well as from uh, the iTunes. Um, this is the UI. Again, this is how we organized it. What am I holding there? This is uh, the spatial contingency curvilinear aspect flash diffuser. And it works like a champ. 
This is actually my Canon 580 EX Flash. And the, you asked about a diffuser before. This is actually the LumaQuest diffuser On that the I pointed out in the B&H uh, catalog. It, it's, it spreads the light. It softens the light. And if you can learn how to handhold this thing. Uh, again, my number one flash tip is take the darn flash off the camera. Hell no. Are you crazy? <laughs> focus groups, it's like, you know, you'd be so dragged down with focus groups, you never get an amp out because everybody's got something different. You know where your app lies? In your heart and in your soul. Put out what you want it to be and you're, you'll succeed or you'll die, but make what you want. That's the only way you're going to get success. It's like cooking. Chefs cook what they want to cook, right? That's how it works. It's the same thing with app development. It's the same thing with photography. You know, imagine shooting a photograph, but you first you do a focus group <laughs> of what the shot should be. It's the same thing, you know? It's got to, at least, you know, I mean, we had friends who looked at it. But we also were lucky because our videos have been out there for years, and we know how people react to them. So we already knew that the video lessons were good. You can contact us. I'll be up here for a little while with my books. And, uh, again, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. appreciate it. Yeah.